All right. Yes, my wife is in Peru with Leslie, and I do have the kids by myself, and I have one thing to say. It's actually very easy. Come on. I, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what the big deal is. Uh, they listen to me in most of the time, right, Levi? Eh, he went, eh. Um, no, it's been a really good time. We've had a, um, a really good week. I think it's an honor to be able to be at a place where I'm able to support my wife and what she's called to and also support our pastors and what they're called to. Um, special, um, where are where Zion and Zealand? Special congratulations for them for winning the wing competition. I mean, winning a wing competition is cool. But, you know, I got red shoes on. So Gail and Eric know what, is, what we're talking about, right? All right. See, see good job on the wing competition. Um, it was fun. We're going to do that every single year. And um, we expect that every year that competition is going to get bigger and better and have different winners. <clears throat> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just teasing. All right, so um, most of you guys know me. My name is Andy, and I am the executive pastor here along with my wife. And um, it is an honor to be able to stand before you guys and preach the word. God's put something on my heart, and I'm very excited about it. Um, I've been working on it all week, but truth be told, it's been something that's been building inside of me for months. Amen. Um, so I want to thank my pastors for trusting me. And for seeing something in me that I never would have seen in myself, when they came to this church, um, I was a very nervous, very young person who suffered from severe anxiety, and the idea of standing in front of somebody and saying anything at all was terrifying. Um, the idea of doing this was not even on the radar. And, and so we have some incredible pastors who really believe in you all way more than you probably believe in yourselves. So they already told you um, they are on their way to Fiji right now for a women's conference and a men's conference. My wife is in Peru, and we are in the middle of a sermon series called The Calling. Yeah. Woo. The Calling, which I think where our pastors are is a really good introduction to the name of our uh, sermon series, right? So I want to do a little bit of a review. The concept of The Calling in, in the Bible is rich and multifaceted. It is deeply embedded in the narrative of God's relationship with humanity. The calling transcends a mere invitation or a task, and it signifies a divine summon that shapes identity, purpose, and, and destiny. And if we're being honest with each other, all of us in this room have had questions about identity, purpose, or destiny, or all three of them. At some point in their life, if it's not right now, you've wondered, what in the world was I built for? Why was I put on this earth? What am I going to do? There's got to be more to life than this. And the reality is, when we get to our calling, those three questions are answered. Our identity, our purpose, and our destiny. The word calling in the Bible was translated from several Hebrew and Greek terms. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word gara means to call out or to proclaim. In the New Testament, the Greek word kalio and its derivatives, which is klesis and kletos, are used denoting an invitation or a summons. The usage of these terms can vary from a literal call, as in like calling somebody's name, to a metaphorical sense implying a divine inv invitation to participate in God's purpose on earth. We see this... Um, when Jesus changes Simon's name to Peter, he called him, that's that word, um, kletos, or um, uh, kalio, okay? Um, in Romans 8, 29, verses, uh, verses 28, and, I'm sorry, 8, verses 29 and 30, Paul writes, and this isn't on the screen, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among, among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also <clears throat> called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. That's Romans 8, 29 and 30. Um, you also see God calling Abraham in Genesis 12 to leave his country and his family, initiating a covenant relationship. And in the, the New Testament, Jesus calls his disciples, very simply. He says, come and follow me. And at that point, there was a transformation a mission that was at hand. And the truth that we want to tell you guys through this series is that we've all been called. Come on. 
Do we have a cricket sound effect that we can say? We've all been called. Yeah? Ephesians 4, verse 1 says, I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord. This is Paul writing. Actually, he's a prisoner for the Lord, but also, like, he's a prisoner for Rome. Like, there, it's both and, okay? It says, I, Paul, or I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Calling is not something that we have to dig through Scripture a lot to figure out where it is. It is everywhere that you look. Now, there are personal callings and there are corporate callings. Both of these calls... Um, both of these calls are related. A corporate calling calls to, uh, or pertains to an entire group. We have a corporate calling at Discover Life Church. We call it our vision. We, we exist so that all people can discover real life in Christ and fulfilling their God-given purpose. Amen. That's our corporate calling. We exist so that people can walk through this door and, and they can connect with something bigger than themselves so that they can um, connect with their identity, that they can connect with their purpose. They can, they can figure out what on earth they are here for. Please stand for the reading of the word. All right, I've got a lot of scripture, which I think is a very good thing. So, um, so we're gonna start in 2 Kings 7, Verses three through nine. Um, if you guys see bold and underline, come in with a. That sounds good. All right. Now, there were four men who were lepers at the entrance to the gate. And they said to one another, why are we sitting here until we die? If we say, let us enter the city, the famine is in the city and we shall die there. You guys encouraged yet? And. Getting more encouraging. So now come over to the camp of the Syrians. If they spare our lives, we shall live. If they kill us, we shall but die. Mm -hmm. So they arose to go to the camp of the Syrians. But when they came to the edge of the camp of the Syrians, behold, there was no one there. For the Lord had made the army of the Syrians hear the sound of chariots and of horses, the sound of a great army, so that they said to one another, Behold, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Egypt to come against us. So they fled away and abandoned their tents, their horses, and their donkeys, leaving the camp as it was and fled for their lives. And when these lepers came to the edge of the camp, they went into a tent, they ate and they drank, and they carried off silver and gold and clothing and went and hid them. Then they came back and entered another tent. All that was from one tent. And carried off things from it and went and hid them. Then they said to one another, we are not doing right. This is a day of good news. If we are silent and wait until the morning light, punishment will overtake us. Now, therefore, come. Let us go and tell the king's household. All right, now we're going to jump over to John chapter 2. This is verses one through five. We all know this story. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman. I don't know how y'all were raised, but, but can you raise your hand if you ever called your mom a woman? There's three, three people. You know, everybody else who's done it, you know why they're not here? <laughs> uh, it took one time for, for Jose. He said one time. What, he said, Jesus said, woman. I, th I don't know. Sometimes you got to add your own, you know, emphasis and all that. So maybe he was like, woman. Or like, woman. Either way, he said, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother, <laughs> there's a little bit of mama in him. Right? She said, she looked at the servants and said to them, do whatever he tells you. Sorry, I jumped ahead. I forgot it was underlined. Say it again. Do whatever he tells you. Yes, do whatever he tells you. He, she didn't argue with him. She just, she said, woman. <laughs> okay, we'll deal with that later. Do whatever he tells you. This is the word of the Lord. Before you sit down, look at your neighbor and say, it's time for action. Sit down, sit down, talk to people. All right. So the title of my message 
is the call to action. And I'm learning that in the Western church, this can be kind of a touchy subject because in the Western church, we've created a machine where it's all about our comfort. We go to church on Sunday because we get free things. Um, churches have t-shirt cannons and free coffee and all of the great things that people want when they go to an event. However, when they show up at church, they're expecting the same thing. So when we say it's the call to action, the Western culture would assume that their call to action would be to wake up a little bit earlier on Sunday morning, get to church, get out before um, football starts. Right? Uh, um, so it's this watered down Christianity. We show up to church um, and, and we think that we've done everything that Jesus has asked us to do. So we get in our nice cars, we drive to church, we, we lift our hands, maybe lift our hands and worship. Um, we need it to last about an hour to an hour and a half. And, and, then, and then we get back in our cars and if the parking lot's crowded, we, we try not to cuss out the person that cut us off. And, and then we, we drive home or we go get lunch. And if the person, someone doesn't give us our food at the restaurant the right way, we make the servers cry. We're notoriously known for leaving terrible tips. And then we go home and we watch football. And that's, that's the Western culture Christianity. Oh, and then we wake up the next day and we go to church and complain about our jobs. It's really quiet in here. I should have got a cricket sound effect so we could, yeah, I just cue you guys and you guys just go, you know. So, but when I say action, some people straight or jump straight into performance, right? Lights, camera, so they think that, that when I say action, there's a show that they have to put on, that there's some performance that they have to do because when I say action, they immediately think people are watching me. And because people are watching me, I've got to do something the right way or I've got to do something so I don't get talked to or talked about. And then we've got some people that say, well, we're, we're called to the presence of God. And that's where I want to stay. I want to be careful here because I'm not discounting time in God's presence. I'm not discounting studying his word or prayer or worship or fasting. However, these are not callings. These are foundational disciplines of our faith. Without them, we can't deepen our relationship with the Father. Without them, there can't be action without a performance mindset, without getting offended, without trying to act your way into heaven or do something to please man. We have to have all of those things. However, you're not called to be in the presence of the Father. When you're saved, you are in the presence of the Father, and it's your job and your discipline and your, your, everything that you do to, to seek his face. And from that, we get called to action? <laughs> Ask like a question. The title of my sermon today is the call to action. There we go. Okay. All right. Um, so I want to make sure that at Discover Life Church, we understand that there's something more, that there's something deeper, that something that when we get a taste of it, we know that there's more to what we're doing than getting out of hell. Because that cannot be the foundation of what we believe because that's a, a very strange thing because I think I've said this before, there are a lot of people that think, well, I'm already in hell. Like this life is hell, this world is hell. So if, if the selling ticket is just, you know, you don't have to do this forever, it's not it's not what it was ever meant to be. This morning, I want to show you that when we take action, God meets us in our obedience and does more than we could ever imagine. Okay? So, so let's start with the lepers. Now, we read the scripture, but to understand it, we have to understand some other things, okay? Um, in this time, as lepers, they were outcasts, right? They, they were contagious no one wanted to catch leprosy. And so what happened when somebody showed signs of leprosy, they were cast out of the city gates and they were forced to live on the land alone or in a leprosy, leper, leper camp. They weren't just seen as physically unclean either, but they were also seen as ceremonially unclean. Nobody wanted to be around them and it was a fear. So they were forced out of society and they, they lived alone. And if by chance... They were to come upon somebody that we would consider a normal person. They were to cover their upper lip. And then before the person got to them, I think it's six cubits away or three cubits away. And they, they had to yell, unclean, unclean, unclean. And, and that was how they had to live their life. Whenever they got around or near somebody, that's what they had to do. And they had to go away. Traditionally, how lepers would eat is they would eat the scraps that people threw out of the city and they would 
find that. Or they would live off of the land. But right now in history, there's not a lot of scraps because Israel is experiencing a famine. So where we are historically is that Israel has split. So we have a northern kingdom, which is Israel, and then the southern kingdom, which is Judah. Okay, the, the northern kingdom, the capital is Samaria, and the lepers right now are outside of the city gates of Samaria. Okay? Um, and, and the Syrians, which we read about in Scripture, they're trying to besiege Israel. And so what they're doing is they're attacking, but their main um, strategy is to cut off all supplies. So what they're doing is they're trying to squeeze them out. So they're cutting off supplies of water, supplies of food, um, and destroying the land so that the land can't produce anything in hopes that what will happen is either everybody in Israel will die or they will give up and then the Syrians can take over Israel. It's a strange place to be. We're in Israel, which God has promised will last forever but everything around us is saying that we're dead. Whole nother thing. But this is a terrible famine. It's very successful. And because of that, there's not a lot of scraps. So these lepers are not like lepers from the past. There's not scraps to eat from. They think that they're going to die. The land has been destroyed, so they can't eat leaves. And, and how bad was that famine? In 2 Kings verse 6, just one chapter earlier, it actually says that the famine was so severe that people were resorting to cannibalism. Which is crazy that having leprosy is ceremonially unclean, but like eating other humans is like, that's cool. But that's the law for you, right? Because we can justify stuff when we need to. But it's, a, it's this crazy thing that we do. But, but for some reason, right now, they're not throwing scraps away. They're so hungry that they're eating other human beings. So even the people within the walls were desperate. So why would we throw scraps to the lepers? It doesn't make sense. So these lepers are, are in a place where they have absolutely nothing. They're withering away. And not only that, they're in pain all the time. Their flesh is rotting. And so they get to this point where they basically lay, off, lay out all of their options. They say, well, we can wait at the gate until we die, which is what we're doing now. Um, we could... Just re-enter the besieged city and then die because they don't have food either. And even if they did have food, when we went in there, they would arrest us and beat us and throw us out again anyway. So either way, when we do that, we're dead. Or we can go over to the Syrian camp, the opposing army, whose main goal is to kill everybody in Israel or have them surrender. And what we can do is we can just beg for mercy. Worst case scenario, we're dead anyway. Have we been there before? I mean, I know I'm being super encouraging right now. I promise. I promise it gets better, okay? But, but we've been there before, right? Uh, maybe not like to the point of death. Maybe you have been. Three options and all of them point to death. But maybe we're weighing all of our options. As everybody said, well, I could pay the light bill, but then we're not going to have cold, uh, hot water. Right? I could pay the car note, but then I won't be able to pay my mortgage. I can do this, but then I won't be able to do that. And all of a sudden, we're realizing that we're in a place in our life where if I do this, everything's going to fall apart or I'm going to die. But if I don't do this, everything's going to fall apart and I'm going to die. And, and we live our life in this tension because we sit around and we weigh our options and we don't take action. And what we can learn from these lepers is, is exactly what they did is they chose the best of the terrible options. They said, we're going to die anyway. Let's go back. So not only did they have to try to live, but in order to do it, they had to humble themselves. And they thought that they were going to go and just lay down before the Syrians and say, don't kill us. And maybe if you're going to kill us, can we get some of that steak first? I don't want to die hungry. <laughs> have we been there before? <laughs> Sometimes there are just no good options. So they choose the best of the worst. And so they decide that the best thing for us to do is go to the opposing army, whose job again is their job is to kill us, and we're going to beg for mercy. And this is it in 2 Kings, um, in verses 4 through 5. It says, And if we sit here, we die also. So come now, or now come. Let us go. Sorry, I'm, it's on go. You guys do it, not me. Over to the camp of the Syrians. If, if, they spare our lives, we shall live. And if they kill us, 
nothing changes. <laughs> nothing changes. We're still dead. So, so they took action. And so it says, so they arose to go to the camp of the Syrians. They took action. They said that one thing is for sure. If we sit here, we're dead. Which actually ties directly to James verses two, or verse two, or James two, verse 17. So also by faith itself, it does not have works. If it does not have works, it's dead. This is very literally true for these guys. They could sit around all day and say, I think that if we go to this camp, the Syrians are going to have mercy on us. I believe that when we get there, the Syrians are going to give us food. I believe with everything inside of me that these Syrians are actually good people that are misunderstood. And what's going to happen is when we get there, they're going to greet us with a cup of water and fill in the blank, a steak, a burger, a, um, let's do something not red meat, chicken. Um, they can believe that all they want. But if they do that, they're just going to die believing. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And that's what I'm trying to get across this morning. The lepers had to believe that they had a little bit of a chance. They didn't give up. At dawn they rose and and, and they started going. They have no clue what is going to happen. The whole time they're walking. I don't know. It doesn't say what their conversation was. But I imagine it's going to be like... So if they attack us, like, do we fight back? Are we strong enough to fight back? What are we going to do um, if, if they attack us or if they give us food? But what if there's not enough food for everybody? It, will I eat or will you eat? What are we going to do? What if they're so scared of us that they just kill us right on the spot? Are they going to make us watch them kill you? This is an opposing army. We don't know how cruel they are. We don't know how nice they are. They have no clue what's going to happen. Proverbs 16, 9 says, the heart of a man plans his ways, but the, but the Lord establishes his steps. And so they stepped, even though they were unsure of the outcome. There was something bigger at play. These lepers made a decision. If we die, we're not going to die sitting still. So they got up at twilight and headed for the camp of the Syrians. Now, when they arrived at the camp, the best possible outcome has happened, right? Right? Because nobody is there, which I think weighing every, I don't think while they were walking down the road, they said, what if nobody's there? What if the camp is gone? Like the Syrians are not just going to give up. That doesn't make sense. They've, they've held this long for the famine to take place. There's no reason for them to give up. So in second Kings, um, verse uh, seven, verse five through seven, it says, but when they came to the edge of the camp of the Syrians, behold, there was no one there. For the Lord had made the army of the Syrians hear the sound of chariots and of horses, the sound of a great army, so that they said to one another, Behold, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Egypt, other nations, so that they would be strong enough to fight, to come against us. So, and abandoned their tents, their horses, and their donkeys, leaving the camp as it was, and fled for their lives. Do you guys see it? The Lord made the army hear sounds of chariots and horses and a great army. But in verse 7, it says that they fled away in the twilight. When? A little bit louder. When? They fled in the twilight, which is weird because in verse 5, it says that the lepers arose to go to the camp of the Syrians. This is crazy, and this is something that we have to understand. That, that It says at twilight. So I say when, you say at twilight. When? When? But in reality, I believe that that would have been, whether it was sunset or sunrise or high noon, if the lepers had arose at high noon, then the Lord would have made the Syrians hear noises at high noon. Because this is the principle that we have to get. When, God, when we move, God moves. We have to understand this. Our action activates God's miraculous intervention. Because the story continues. Uh, we didn't read all of it because it is a lot. It's funny, though. So, so here, here's what happens, okay? They sneak up on the camp. And their hearts are beating. They don't know what's going to happen. They're going to die. And most likely, these lepers didn't know each other. They just became friends because they had a similar skin condition. 
And so they're, they're, they're going to die. And then I'm sure one of them might be thinking, like, like if they come at me, like, I'm throwing him in front. Like, you guys know the thing, like, if you're in the woods and you're being chased by the bear, you don't have to be faster than the bear. I just got to be faster than Pastor Eric. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, you, you, I, I think that that's probably what these guys are thinking. Like, okay, I'm going to get some food, whatever. But then they get there, and the tent's empty. Well, that, that doesn't make sense. And, and so they start going through everything, and they realize this, this, this camp is abandoned. But what's crazier is they left everything the donkeys, the horses, the food. They're running through the camp and they're like, yeah, we got gold chains. Guys, they got gold in here. There's silver in here. We got all you can eat buffet. Drinks, drinks. Who wants drinks? And they travel with wine. So you know they're pouring wine into a gold cup and they're balling. <laughs> and then they started doing what we do as humans, right? Because when we, when we start getting stuff and we start getting blessed and we start receiving things, what do we do? We hide it away. We, we, we hide it away. And so they're hiding it everywhere because they don't know the next time they're going to see food. This isn't like a terrible thing that they're doing. This is a logical thing. They, they're like, okay, we got food, but we haven't had food. We know that we're, we just, we went over the options. The city doesn't have any food. There's no food to be had. So what we're going to do is we're going to hide everything away, stash some gold, and we're going to be all right. They're bawling out. Then something happens inside of them. Right, because in, in verse 9 it says, Then they said to one another, We're not doing right. This day is a day of good news. If we're silent and we wait until the morning light, punishment will overtake us. And I don't know what punishment doesn't say, but there's something happening inside of them where they're going, even if they're, we don't get caught, I don't know if I can live with myself. With this good news, this thing that has happened inside of us, something is going to happen tomorrow and it's not going to feel right. So therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. Okay, something inside them has shifted. They, they knew they needed to tell somebody because they recognized that they were getting something they didn't deserve. Something in them changed. They went from we ball into we got to tell everyone. And there's a lesson here for us all. God's blessings are never meant to be hoarded. The moment we experience God's provision, his miracles and his grace, we are called to share it. There's no questions about it. When we experience the blessings of God, when God touches our lives, it's not something that we say, well, now I get a personal relationship with Jesus. This is what Pastor Manny has been talking about for the last two weeks. There is a community that has to happen when that takes place. And because we've experienced something that we didn't deserve, doubt. Do you guys know what grace is? It's what we don't deserve. Grace is getting something that we don't deserve. And so when we get something that we don't deserve, our first response should be to share it. And that's what they do. So they said, we've got to tell the king. But in reality, they already know they can't enter the city. Right? So they do the best they can and they go to the gates and they tell the guards because they're not allowed inside the gates. And they, they tell them, like, hey, listen, I, I don't know. You don't have to believe us. Nobody probably would. But just so you know, the Syrian camp is empty. Well, not empty, but, like, there's no people there. But there's, like, gold. Maybe not as much as there was. I don't know. But I'm just, <laughs> I'm just thinking. Um, there's horses. There's donkeys. There's food. There's wine. We've got to figure this out. You guys have got to do something. And that's what they do. Because of their actions, because the actions of the lepers the city was saved because of the unexpected action of four unlikely heroes. God's promise to Israel was preserved. So what are we going to do about it? Well, let's move over to um, John chapter two. And so we're going to read, we already read a story that like even unbelievers are familiar with, right? Water into wine. <laughs> like this is the one that everybody likes. Like you never saw a Pharisee yelling about that one. Right, the Pharisees did not show up and go, wait a minute, what is the meaning of all of this? That didn't happen because water into wine is like a cool miracle that everybody could get on board with. Right? Yeah. Like, we like water into wine. So, so just to clear things up, like this isn't the chosen. And so the way that this all played out isn't exactly like the TV show. It was a little bit different. So when, when the disciples were called... 
Well, there were some moments where they said, this is the son of God. No actual miracle had been performed. So, so Jesus shows up and is like, hey, you're a terrible fisherman. Come with me. <laughs> he was a bad fisherman. I get a lot of hate on YouTube for that, but I, I stand by it. I stand by it. He was a good fisher of men. But he was a bad fisherman. So anyway, Jesus said, come with me. And, and then he's like, yeah, what are we going to do? And you're the, what are we doing? You're the son of God. And, and, and Jesus said, well, we're going to a wedding. Okay. And so we, we, we start off the story. And so on the third day, there's this wedding in Cana. And the mother of Jesus was there. And Jesus was also invited to the wedding with his disciples. And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. So I think Jesus is saying something true here. He's saying like, it's not my time. This isn't how I planned it. This is, this is not what we were supposed to do. But, but Mary put a call and an expectation on Jesus. She said, it's time for action. Do whatever he tells you. And what he told them to do was to fill six stone jars that each held 20 to 30 gallons with water. Okay, so this story reads really fast. So if you read John chapter two, it's a very quick read. And we can read it from our own comfort. And sometimes I think we can lose some stuff from that because we think filling six stone jars, just grab the water hose. Just, you know, fill up each stone jar and we're good to go. So I was thinking about this and I was praying about it. I'm trying to figure out how did they do that? So I got out a calculator and um, my archaeological, ar, arche, <laughs> archaeological Bible is the archaeology Bible. That's what it's called. My archaeology Bible uh, just wasn't happening, guys. I don't know what's going on. I got out my Bible that talks about like rocks and stuff. And, <laughs> and, and so I'm researching it and I'm realizing some things, right? Because we have six jars that hold 20 to 30 gallons of water. So we're looking at between 120 and 180 gallons of water, okay? We also know in that time, mostly it was women who um, drew from the well, okay? I'm gonna get canceled. Because of this, this is what my Bible says. Because of this, the buckets were kept relatively small because on average, a woman cannot lift as much as a man. So because of this, the buckets could only hold two to three gallons of water. And this is how they had to fill up the jars. They had to go to the well, pull up the buckets, take the buckets back to the jar because the jars were stone. They could not carry the jars alone, let alone with water in them. So then what they had to do is they had to come up with a plan to get to the well, draw the water, and then come back to the jar and pull it or pour it. So a bucket of water, pulling it out of the well, could weigh anywhere from 16 to 25 pounds. So I did the math. And in order to fill the jars, it would have taken anywhere from 42 to 60 trips to the well. Now, there were servants, not a servant. So I understand that this process can be mitigated a little bit, but... The well, by the way, in a rural village like Cana, um, could have been anywhere from 200 yards away all the way to a mile away. So we think sometimes that working with Jesus is easy because we read the chapter and we're like, hey, water, wine, everyone was happy. It turned out really good. But we need to read a little bit more. So there are six stone jars. This is um, verses six and through eight. Now, there were six stone jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to, and he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. Now. Now. You don't think. Okay, so what, what, what happened is all the jars were filled with water. All the jars were filled with water before there was any wine. And, and we think, like, should he have, like, just turned the well into wine? Like, that would, have been, that would have been quicker. Could he have at least let them see the wine be poured from the buckets into the jar so that, like, they could be encouraged so they could keep doing the work, right? That's what we expect in our American culture, right, is 
Like, I can see little miracles happening, and because I can see little miracles happening, I'm going to keep going because it gives me the motivation to keep going. But that's not what we're reading in this story. We have to read our scripture, and we have to ask questions. He's Jesus. He can do anything that he wants. He could have just gone, there's wine. But that's not what he did. He said, you do it. You do it. We, we hear that a lot. If you, if you read through the scriptures, remember when um, they rode across this long lake and there's like a whole thing that happened and, and then thousands of people are there. So Jesus starts preaching to them and he, he's preaching into the night and then the disciples are like, yo, these guys are hungry. <clears throat> these guys are hungry. <laughs> we should send them off now so that they could get something to eat. And Jesus looked at his disciples and he said, you feed them. You feed them. And so it says that, the fill, that they filled them up to the brim, and then he told them, draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So this whole thing, this was a whole thing. I don't know how many servants they had. I don't know if they set up an assembly line. I don't know. But if they were walking to the well and coming back combined, the servants could have walked anywhere from 14 to 120 miles that day, carrying two to three gallons half of the time. The jars had to be full before the miracle could happen. What we learn from that is that action will almost always precede a miracle. We can read that in Hebrews 11. Um, It says, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. There was action for that miracle. Now, I want to be clear. We don't act to force God's hand. Because when we do that, all of a sudden, everything is shifted, and our heart has shifted, and our mind has shifted, and our, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? There's a, um, our motive, maybe, motive is good, I'll take motive. Our motive has shifted. We act knowing that God's hand is already moving. We, we don't know the timing. Can I get an amen on that one? Amen. Like, that should be a good amen. We don't know the timing. We don't know the method. Like, if, if you want to laugh... Ask God the timing. If you want to really laugh, ask God how he's going to do it. (laughs) Because it never looks like how we wanted it to look, right? We don't know any of that, but we do know one thing, and that is God is always on time. That God is always up to something. Just like the um, lepers who had to get up and go, or the servants who had to fill. Let me change that because, you know, you know who I am. Just like the lepers who got to get up and go, <laughs> or the servants who got to fill up the jars. We are all called to action. Amen. But here's the beautiful part, and something that we need to leave here today with, is we are called to action, but we're not called to be alone. There were four lepers. There were servants. They were not alone. And even had they been, Jesus was with them. Philippians 2, 12 through 13 reminds us that, um, says, work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. But that it is God who works in us, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. He's inside of us. So we're never alone. So here, so there are people in this room today who are supposed to adopt. But for some reason, you haven't done the paperwork or you think that the process is too hard or you think, like, it's just not going to work out the way that I want it to work out or we need a bigger home before we can adopt. All of these things. But in reality, the only thing that you have is an idea that hasn't turned into anything partly because you're not taking action. You're not telling anybody that you're wanting to adopt. Nothing is taking place because we're not living in a covenant community. There are people in this room who, um, who have phone calls that they haven't made. You need to forgive somebody or you need to call somebody uh, in your life and apologize to them for something that you've done or said. And before anything can break through in your life, you're praying for a breakthrough, but you haven't given the forgiveness that God's called you to forgive. There's action that needs to be taken. There are people in here today that need to draw a line in the sand with their significant other and say, do not cross this line. We're not doing that anymore. We're praying for a breakthrough, but we're breaking boundaries and we're, and we're crossing boundaries that we shouldn't be crossing. And the fact of the matter is, there's actions that we need to take. Amen. 
There are people in this room today who, who want to tithe but just haven't started. They're saying, oh, I'll start tithing when the money gets right or, or when I get a raise or I get that promotion that I've been waiting for. Then I can start tithing because things will make sense. But in reality, we've got to take action. When we take action, God moves. Some of y'all should own a business. But all you've done is designed a logo. You can't, you can't just say you're supposed to do something and it's going to happen. Then you will be the lepers who are saying, well, we know, we hope that Syria, the Syrians will forgive us. Let's just die on that right. Let's just die knowing that. Some of y'all are supposed to support missionaries. You've got the abundance. The money is right. <laughs> but like the lepers in the camp... We're just hiding it away because we don't know when the next famine is going to come. But in reality, some of that money should be going to some missionaries around the world who are spreading the word of Jesus Christ in, in ways that we can't or we, we haven't been called to. There are people here today who need to take action. We see this clearly in both stories. But I want to take it a step further if I could. If we could for a minute imagine... Imagine, this is not in the Bible. I am imagining something here. I just need to be very clear. Imagine for a moment that these lepers were healed of their disease. Let's think about it. According to the law of Moses, they could not have just walked back into town and resumed life as normal. There's a process that they have to go through, right? They were, they were considered unclean, not only physically unclean, but spiritually unclean. And because of that, there's a spiritual ritual that they would have had to go through. Leviticus 14 tells us that they would have had to go through a purification process. And what they would have had to do was um, they would go to the priest and they would say, look, I'm healed. And then the priest would say, okay, you're healed. What you have to do is wash yourself in um, a ceremonial jar, the kind that would be used for a ritual cleansing. The jars at the wedding that were meant for external cleansing are the same kind of jars that, yeah, I worded that wrong. The same jars that were at the wedding. That's what they would have had to use to cleanse themselves. In John 2, verse 6, again, it says, now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. See, when the leper was healed, they had to bathe in that water. They had to purify their clothes in that water. And they had to go through this lengthy process to be made clean. It was an external ritual. Something that they had to do over and over again if they became unclean again. And becoming unclean, there are a lot of different things. Uh, coming in contact with a dead body, uh, a woman's monthly cycle, things like that, you're unclean. Can we be honest for a minute? Water into wine is a weird miracle. Like when, when you have read the, the whole Bible, and you look at everything, that one stands out. And, and I think like early on in my life, I thought like, oh yeah, water into wine is a good first miracle. Like what I said earlier, everybody's on board with it. Nobody's getting angry at water into wine. Even if you don't see the miracle happen and believe that he's the Messiah, you still got wine. Everybody's happy with that. But we read all throughout the, the Bible, the lame are healed, the deaf see, demons are cast out, thousands are fed. He walks on water, food is multiplying. He helped a bad fisherman look like a good fisherman. But this one's weird. Water into wine. I think that there's more than meets the eye here. At the wedding, Jesus didn't use those ceremonial jars for a quick fix. He didn't just say, well, we're out of wine, but here's some water. He transformed them from the inside out. He transformed their contents. He took the water meant for external cleansing and turned it into wine. But if we read the whole Bible, we understand that the wine symbolizes his blood. And his blood offers a new kinds of cleansing not one that just washes our outside. 
Not one that every single time we become unclean, we have to go through a process and we have to offer a sacrifice and we have to be washed in the thing. Jesus' blood washes us more than just the outside. It purifies us from within. What the law can only do in part, Jesus does completely. The lepers would have needed water to be declared clean. But now because of Jesus, all we need is his blood. However, before the miracle happened, the servants had to act. They had to obey Jesus' command to fill the jars with water. Water that would later become a symbol of his blood. I want to be reiterate this. Their obedience didn't transform the water. But it prepared the way. And this miracle is more than water into wine. This miracle points to Jesus' ultimate cleansing. And he was sending a, sim, uh, sending a sign that day, a signal. He was saying, right now you cleanse with water. But these purification jars, you're not going to need them anymore. I'm filling them with, with wine, which will symbolize my blood. 1 Samuel 15, verse 22 says, to obey is better than to sacrifice. Their obedience led to the first miracle, but it also pointed to something way deeper. The transformation that comes through Christ's cleansing. Our actions prepares the way for God's miraculous work and the cleansing that comes through Jesus' blood. Don't ever think that your action is just an action. Because when we take action, we're, we're, we're paving the way for somebody to have a revelation of the cleansing, saving blood of Jesus Christ. It's not just showing up at 8 o'clock. It is actually paving a way for somebody to walk through these doors and hear what is happening and look around and say, the Spirit of God is surely here. And because of that, they have a revelation of the cleansing blood of Jesus. And it's not because they just walked through the doors, because we all took action. The servant's action of filling the jars didn't transform the water into wine. It was never meant to transform the water into wine. But the fact of the matter is Jesus needed the water. And he's not going to do it on his own because he's partnered with us. That's why he said, you do it. One more thing I want to clear up. Our actions don't cleanse us. And I think sometimes messages like this, people walk away with questions thinking, well, well, hang on, it sounds a lot like you're saying do, 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 and I'm not. I'm saying be obedient and take action in what, you're, what you've been called to do because we are all called to action. Our actions do prepare us for what only Jesus can do. Like the water transformed into wine, Jesus' blood cleanses us from within. So, so maybe somebody walked through the doors and, and, and metaphorically inside their water, but when the, when the day is over, they're transformed from the inside. And it makes us whole. I have time. And I want to I wanna say that we're not just a church that, that says this stuff because we need something to get done. As I stand here right now, our pastors are in the air over the ocean flying into Fiji to put on a men's conference and a women's conference where they're going to see hundreds, maybe thousands of people come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. My wife right now is in Peru where yesterday she preached at a women's conference with, with Leslie and, and there is a massive move, move, move of God. God can move but it takes action for that to happen. I remember years ago, me and my wife talking and her saying, I just don't know if it's our season. I, I don't know how I could travel because the kids are in school and they're homeschooled. So it takes a lot. And, and I, don't, I don't know if it's my time. And I said, baby, I got you. Because it is your season and it's time for us to take action. And right now, that action for me is waking up and making sure the kids are ready and, and getting them to school when they have to get to school and helping them with homeschool when they're at home. That's my action. So every one of us is in a different season, but I'm so tired of the American church saying, it's not my season, I can't act. 
You can always take action. Season or no season, there's action that needs to be taken. We are a church that believes that with everything that we have. Because our pastors right now, yeah, 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 they're flying to Fiji. And that sounds really great. Like, there's a water from there. You know what I'm saying? But like, you guys know what happened 10 years ago? 10 years ago, there is a couple that felt a call on their life to plant a church in Lawrenceville, Georgia. Uh, a church where the vision will be, we exist so that all people can discover real life in Christ and fulfill their God-given purpose. 10 years ago, Pastor Manny and Pastor Victoria got um, a prophetic word that they were not done at him. They were not, Impact Church wasn't their last church. And for them to get ready. They were comfortable as lead pastors around their family in Miami. And they heard God say, you do it. That was 10 years ago. Now, if you guys know the history, our pastors, Manny and Pastor Victoria did not get here until seven years ago. So for three years, they lived in the tension of home and we're not where we belong. And during that, they, they had to make sure that their debts were cleared up. They had to make sure that they were ready to go. They had to make sure that when they left, Impact Church wouldn't fall because they were gone. They had to get people ready. So for three years, not knowing what God was gonna do, they had to get ready. We just celebrated our 10th anniversary. Come on. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that had Pastor Manny and Pastor Victoria not heard from the Lord and taken action, our church might not be here today. My wife would not be in Peru. People would not be hearing about Jesus from her. And they probably would not be in Fiji. Most of y'all might not, might not have the relationship with God that you have. And it all started 10 years ago, not in the fun stuff where we get to fly on planes and travel the world and do all the stuff. No, it was, your life is about to get really weird because I'm gonna call you to a church that has negative money in the bank account and everybody that's at that church is frustrated and angry and your job is going to be to take those angry people, make them feel like they have a purpose in their life and then keep them around so that the church can go. Not because they need you to tell them that they're good, but because there are people in Lawrenceville, Georgia that need Pastor Manny and Pastor Victoria. There are people in Lawrenceville that need Pastor Ivan to be here. There are people in Lawrenceville that have to hear the word of Jesus Christ and if you don't listen to me now I don't know what's going to happen at Discover Life Church I can't tell y'all where I would be through them coming up here Pastor Manny bringing his mom and her declaring a prophetic word in service I was healed of panic attacks I've not had a panic attack in over seven years because they took action so yeah, it's in, it's in the Bible. But it's not something that we're preaching just because we need people here on as Sunday at 8. I need you guys to take action on Monday at 6 while you're at Publix. I need y'all to take action when you're driving down the road and, and you see somebody pulled over that needs help to stop and call. I need, I need there to be action taken in this community because we are a light on the hill. That's what we're praying right now because it is a prophetic word that was declared over us years ago that we'd be a light on a hill before we ever moved on to Collins Hill Road. We are to be a light on a hill and while we are a building that happens to be on a hill, you guys are called to be a light on a hill. Maybe you're in here today and you don't know Jesus. And so I'm just sounding like a crazy person to you. But, but you related to the lepers. Maybe metaphorically, you've been running around for some time. And whenever you get around somebody who says they're a Christian, you feel the need to cover your mouth and shout, unclean, unclean. Because we've created this culture that we're Christians. So, you know, and if you're in here and that's you, I want you to know that Whatever got you to believe that it's not true. First John uh, 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. I should have underlined that. Can y'all read that? And to cleanse us from all righteousness. You can be cleansed this morning. 
Isaiah 1, 18 says, though your sins are like scarlet, they will become as white as snow. (laughs) Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. So if you're, if you're, if that's you in this room, I want you to take action. I'm just going to count to three and I'm going to ask you to take action and throw your hand in the air. Um, that you want to accept Jesus into your heart and then uh, we'll go from there. But just remember what I've been saying. It takes action. One, two, three. If that's you, raise your hand. And if it's not, that's great. So that means everyone in here is a believer. It doesn't get easier. <laughs> but maybe you're still like the lepers. <laughs> maybe you feel like you're stuck and you're, and you're weighing all of your options. And, 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 and I want to encourage you, if you're stuck and you're weighing all your options and there's no good path, take action. Do something. Maybe, maybe you're like the lepers and you found this camp that's been completely abandoned and, and you're taking all the gold and all the stuff and you're hiding it for yourself. Uh, maybe you've heard the good news of Jesus, but you don't feel comfortable sharing it because you don't want to make anybody else uncomfortable. I got to tell you, that's a hate level that I can't fathom. You cannot take the good news, a light, a lamp, and hide it under a basket. You've got to take action. Matthew 28 says... Um, uh, calls us to go therefore and make disciples of all nations we are called to share the gospel and be active in God's kingdom work if you're in here this morning and and you want to be active in God's kingdom work can you stand up for me please I hope that's everybody (laughs) Heavenly Father, we love you. Heavenly Father, we worship you and we give you all the honor and all the praise and all the glory and we thank you for um, your saving grace. We thank you for the cleansing that has been performed through your blood in us, God. And we just pray right now, every person in this room gets a new motivation inside of them to take action, a, a, a new way, a new idea for them to go into the world and make all disciples, God, so that they can take action because they don't know what their action will, will look like 10 years from now but we know that you are faithful to finish a good work. We know that you are the beginning and the end. We know who you are. And because we know who you are, we know that when we take actions, you move. So God, we stand before you today and we worship you, not just in music, but God, in our hearts and everything that we are, God, we worship you. We give you all the honor, all the praise and all the glory In Jesus' name, shout with me. Amen. Amen. Guys, thank you so much for coming today. It was an honor to be able to stand here. And I don't take lightly the ability to share the word of God with you guys. So I want to remind me before you go that when on your way out, you're going to see a sign that says you are now entering the mission field. That could not be any more true. Leave today, go into the world and make disciples. Thank you guys so much. You are dismissed. Guys, go. Get up. Get up and take action. Your action, your stepping out, you're doing what God is telling you to do or what God has been telling you to do could be the difference between your children being saved. It could be the difference between your grandchildren being saved. So go. Don't wait. Step up and step out into what God is wanting you to do. Absolutely, guys. It's, it's, and it's not, I think it's important to point out, it's not always a big action. It's not always fun but it's important that you do it no matter what. You step out in faith and you do what God is telling you to do because that little action, if you think it's little, has big implications, all right? We love you guys. Obviously, I'm not Juliana, but I love you too. We love you guys. Have a great Sunday. Listen to this word over and over again until it is in your heart. We love you guys. Have a great week. Bye.